to the cloud. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual informal system seminar. Um, this is the first talk in this uh, fall 2022 session. Um, it is our great pleasure to have um, Peter Velikovic as our first speaker for this uh, semester. Um, so it is also my great pleasure to present to you um, Dr. Velikovic. Um, Dr. Velikovic is a staff research scientist at DeepMind, affiliated uh, lecturer at the University of Cambridge and an associate of uh, Clare Hall, Cambridge. He holds a PhD in computer science from um, the University of Cambridge, obtained under the supervision of Pietro Leo. His research concerns the geometric deep learning, um, devising neural network architectures that respect invariances and the symmetries in data. For his contributions, he is recognized as an Ilias scholar in the geometric deep learning program. He is the first author of a uh, graph attention networks, a popular convolutional layer for graphs, and the deep graph infomex, a popular self-supervised learning pipeline for graphs. His research has been used in substantially improving travel time predictions in Google Maps and the guiding intuitions of mathematicians towards new top layer theorems and conjectures. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Velikovic. Thank you very much for the fine introduction, Shuang, and thank you very much for having me indeed. Uh, it is a great pleasure, even virtually, uh, to be speaking uh, at uh, in virtual McGill. I, um, uh, I don't know how clear it is, but two of the works you mentioned in the introduction, I have actually created them while I was in Montreal on my internships. So uh, it is definitely a place I really enjoy coming back to whenever possible, a uh, place of great academic stimulation. So today we will be talking about uh, geometric deep learning, which is one of the things that uh, I've been most recently very passionate about. And uh, I felt like, you know, I'll try to do something a little bit different, right? Like the very term geometric deep learning, if you're not already familiar with it, in which case you know where the story will go. But in case you aren't, it might be good to just stop for a second and think, why do I even care about connecting geometry and deep learning? Or what does geometry even have to do with deep learning, broadly speaking? And to answer that question fully, I need to take you back in time, as this slide implies. And when I say back in time, I mean back in time. So let's say 300 years uh, BC, the time of uh, Euclid, who, as you probably know, is the inventor of what is now known as Euclidean geometry, which for a very, very, very long time was the only way to do geometry. So when you said you were doing geometry, it was synonymous with you were doing Euclidean geometry, which has these postulates that uh, govern how different geometric bodies uh, are situated in what we now know is a Euclidean space. However, uh, something very exciting started to happen around the 1800s when suddenly many mathematicians were very interested in trying to show that indeed Euclidean geometry is the only way to do geometry. And they went about doing that by trying to assume that one of the postulates, specifically the parallel postulate is false and trying to drive a contradiction. But what happened instead is they did not drive a contradiction. They derived a completely new consistent set of geometries that were completely valid from the point of view of the other axioms. And uh, specifically, the first such findings came from Lobachevsky and Bolyai, uh, who have discovered what we now know as hyperbolic geometry. So inside hyperbolic geometry, you can have many, many lines that are parallel to a particular line in a given point. And uh, Bolyai is actually famously quoted as writing to his father after he discovered this, that uh, he discovered such wonderful things that he was amazed out of nothing, he has created a strange new universe. And that's kind of uh, how all of this has influenced us uh, who were working on this in the context of deep learning. And you know, similar effects also happened uh, in the work of Riemann who among other things uh, created the foundations for what we now know as elliptic geometry. So the 1800s were definitely a super exciting time to be studying geometry. Um, and you know, there were all these different approaches to doing it, all with different sets of 
rules, different ways in which they arisen, and therefore very distinct languages between them. So to an emerging mathematics student at the time, one question that probably popped to mind a lot is what is the one true geometry? Like if there's so many different proposals, what is the one that we should actually be using? And several decades later, a prospect of a solution to this problem came from the work uh, this mathematician by the name of Felix Klein, who uh, at the time in 1872 had just been appointed to a professorship position at uh, the German University of uh, Erlangen in Nuremberg. And uh, uh, as his research program at the time, which, which later on became known as the Erlangen program, he proposed what became afterwards a blueprint that allowed us to unify all of the geometries that were in place at that time using a very elegant idea of uh, you can represent the geometry completely by specifying what are the properties that are invariant or symmetric in that particular geometry. And using the language of group theory, you could formalize that quite, uh, quite accurately. And it is quite hard to overstate, like this is a somewhat simple mathematical idea, but it's quite hard to overstate how impactful it was all across uh, the spectrum of maths and sciences. Obviously in maths, it provided a path that allowed us to unify all of these geometries together. And this was finally finished uh, by the work of Ely Cartan in the 1920s. However, it had also amazing spillover effect into physics. So for any physicists in the room, you probably know about Emmy Noether, who, is, uh, who was actually Felix Klein's colleague. And she applied very similar ideas to show that in the domain of physics, you can use these symmetries to say that all of the conservation laws in physics are derivable from symmetry. And in fact, uh, it had also great uh, follow on effects in that these ideas allowed us to derive what is now known as the standard model in physics. So very, very massively influential work in physics was caused by this. And uh, I come from theoretical computer science and one of the most popular theoretical areas of math currently used to talk about the structure in computer science is the field of category theory. And in the very words of the founders of category theory, their area is basically a direct extension of Felix Klein's Erlangen program. So basically left, right, and center, this simple unification idea had massive effects all over the sciences. So now at this point, you might be wondering, okay, it's a fascinating idea, but what the hell does it have to do with deep learning, right? Because like we are here to talk about a machine learning technique and all I've done so far was talk to you about maths for 10 minutes. So why is this all important? Well, think a little bit about how deep learning looks like right now, circa year 2020. You have all these other very interesting deep learning architectures, many of them coming from different uh, waves, different directions, and all proposing something that feels general, right? It's often accompanied with these kinds of bombastic statements like, everything can be seen as a special case of a convnet. Uh, transformers use self-attention, and as we know, attention is all you need. Everything is graph structured, so graph neural networks are the way to go, and long short-term memories are Turing complete, so why would you ever need anything else, right? These kinds of claims every now and then pop out from the papers that you see in the deep learning literature, and someone who wants to enter and study the field might very naturally be asking, what is the one true architecture? So I hope you can see the similarities here, but at least to us it, uh, who, who worked on this for the past few years, uh, the field of deep learning circa 2020 feels a lot like geometry felt in 1800s. And uh, if history is to teach us anything, this means now is the right time to look at the geometric principles behind these deep learning architectures and maybe use some of the ideas of the Erlangen program to try to answer this question by instead categorizing the architectures. And you know, I come from graph representation learning, so people might also be asking, could graph neural networks be the answer since I'm advocating for them so much? And there is some truth to this in the sense that if you squint hard enough, many neural networks that we know about can be seen as message passing over some kind of a graph structure where that graph structure might be more or less regular depending on are you doing convolutions, recurrent layers and stuff like that. So they could definitely play a part in the one true architecture. But to do this, we need to understand graph neural networks beyond their basic formulation of permutation equivariance. So with all that in mind, now it's our turn to study geometry. So um, my name is Petr Velichkovic, and alongside with uh, the three of my collaborators, Michael Bronstein from Oxford and Twitter, John Bruna from NYU, and Taco Cohen from Qualcomm, 
we set out to see to what extent can we use uh, Felix Klein's ideas uh, and apply them in the area of deep learning. We believe we've been fairly successful. We published a proto book of about 150 pages on the archive. You can find all the details on geometricdeeplearning.com. And uh, we have actually been recently confirmed for a book contract with MIT Press. So this will come out as an actual book uh, sometime next year. And that is the topic of my lecture today, geometric deep learning. So uh, let's dive into what do we actually show inside this book and to what extent it's potentially useful. Well, first of all, let me restate something that is reasonably well known of a problem around just generally learning stuff in high dimensions. And deep learning is very much focused on learning things in a high dimensional space. In general, it's actually quite known that learning a function, a target function in a high dimensional space is a cursed problem, an intractable problem. And that is because of what we know is the curse of dimensionality. Even if we restrict our target function to be within a very well-behaved set, like say one Lipschitz functions that are not allowed to change too much at any particular point, you can still construct these uh, nasty counter examples that would require you to have an exponentially increasing number of training samples as you increase the dimension in which you learn it. So you can imagine this kind of uh, k-dimensional uh, spherical object with these one Lipschitz peaks attached to it. Around that peak, you need to build a bunch of training examples to fit it properly. So basically this means as you increase the dimensionality of your problem, the number of training examples you need to fit it grows exponentially. And this is a, obviously a bit of a problem. And uh, how do we work this? Like deep learning still works in a high dimensional space. So how do we get it to work? Well, usually, and in mostly all of these architectures, this is the case. There is some assumption about the underlying geometry of the data that we can exploit when building these models. And often what we refer to when we say this uh, is the so-called uh, inductive biases. So inductive biases in a nutshell, restrict your hypothesis space. So the space of possible functions that you can have to only the functions that respect the geometry of the data. And this as a result drastically reduces the space of functions that you need to fit and therefore makes your high dimensional problem more tractable. And here are a few popular examples of this. One very popular one, which is very omnipresent in image classification is uh, that uh, you can process image data independently of any shifts applied to the image like this image of a cat. If you have data that lives on something more exotic, like the sphere, you might have different kinds of uh, regularities. So if uh, I have this smiley face, which lives on the sphere, I can rotate it or twist it in any kind of way along the surface of the sphere, it is still the same smiley face. So spherical data is typically processed independently of these kinds of rotations. And finally, uh, if you have data which lives on a graph structure, uh, then that should be processed independently of any kind of isomorphism transformation on those graphs. So here I've given you two graphs that if you stare at them closely enough, you'll find that they're actually exactly the same graph. I just presented it in a slightly different way. And ideally, if I build a graph neural network over these graphs, I should expect the same answers when applied on these two. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to formalize this to make it a very formal mathematical theory behind what all this regularity and geometry means. And to do that, I'm going to need to define a few more terms. So first of all, we're going to talk about our data as living on some domain omega. You can think of omega as the collection of all the parts of your input. So for example, in the case of an image, as you see on the right-hand side here, omega is just the n times n grid. So it's the set of all pixels in an n times n uh, grid. And also in deep learning, we're typically interested in not just having a domain where the data lives, but also attaching some features on that domain. So often we need some feature space, which we call here C, some kind of vector space. And uh, once we have both omega and C, we can talk about what it means to featureize a domain. And that typically is expressed by having the space X omega C of all functions that map elements of omega to the corresponding features. So the C in the case of images will typically be this R3. So it's a space of red, green, and blue intensity values. So this function X then maps every single pixel to its corresponding uh, three-dimensional color representation, right? 
Now, one thing that's very convenient for us, especially as we're going to be working with linear algebra, like most deep learning does, is that whenever omega is discrete, and almost always we're going to be able to at least assume that it's discrete, we can represent these signals X by just capital X matrices that have a number of rows equal to the number of elements on the domain and the number of columns equal to the dimensionality of the vector space. So this is a typical way in which you might represent a feature matrix, number of objects times number of features. And the ith row of that matrix then gives you the features of the ith element of the domain. And also, uh, we, can also we should also assume some additional structure over these vectors, uh, 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 vector spaces, just so that it is well behaved when we do some standard operations. Specifically, we induce what is known as a Hilbert space structure. It means uh, nothing else than uh, that uh, whenever we take any linear combination of two feature functions, it is the same as if we look up the feature function first and then compute the linear combination. And further, uh, we can all, all often assume that there is some kind of inner product over that space, and then also a measure over the set omega, which allows us to actually take inner products of these two functions that map uh, points to their features. And this uh, inner product is defined in the usual way. You integrate over all of omega the pointwise inner products of uh, the two functions. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about symmetries, which, as I said, are kind of central to Felix Klein's Erlangen program. A symmetry, generally speaking, is any transformation of an object that leaves it unchanged. And uh, that's often best visualized in terms of a concrete example. And here it is for uh, the domain of triangles. So imagine that you want to process data that lives on a triangle, and your data lives in the three corners of the triangle. There are certain things I can do to that triangle that don't fundamentally change which triangle I'm looking at. And those are the rotations and horizontal flips. And here you have all the possible configurations of that same triangle just viewed from a different angle by rotating it or by flipping it. And this collection of operations, the rotations and the flips, specifies the collection of symmetries of this particular object that we care about. And just by saying that symmetry is a transformation that leaves the object unchanged, like just the very act of saying that imposes several mathematical properties. The first one is that there must be an identity transformation and that one must be a symmetry because by definition an identity doesn't change anything. Uh, then if we have two different symmetries, you should always be able to compose one with the other and the composition is also a symmetry. Then because it leaves the object unchanged, you, you haven't destroyed any information, therefore any symmetry must be invertible. And further, the inverse itself is also a symmetry. So these are all properties that are basically directly induced by the fact I said it leaves the object unchanged. And as a result, when you collect all these axioms together, you actually end up recovering a very standard mathematical object, which is the group. And if you are not familiar with groups before, I here outlined the basic axioms that uh, an abstract group must satisfy. So typically we think of a group as the set G, which is a collection of these transformations. And we have a binary operator, which is basically a composition operation of the two transformations. And that composition must satisfy associativity. Uh, there must exist inverses. There must exist a unique identity and we must have closure. And uh, hopefully all these axioms make sense. And if you want to see more examples of pretty groups, on the right-hand side here, you have one of my favorite symmetry groups, which are the symmetries of the Rubik's cube. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, we, it's not sufficient to just talk about a symmetry group. That's just a collection of abstract objects. It is important to also talk about when I have a symmetry, how does it act over my data, those functions that map... Uh, omega to x, uh, sorry, omega to c. So as we said, a symmetry group, you can typically interpret it as a group of transformation that take points on omega to different points on omega, and your group operations are compositions. And then you can define something known as a group action, which is just something that takes a group element and takes uh, a point on omega, uh, such that the usual identity and composition laws apply. And all that it does really is apply the function specified by that element on that domain. 
And this is one particular uh, example of a group action. If you have some kind of Euclidean transformation, like a rotation by theta and translation by T, uh, you can express what that uh, transformation does to any point in the plane by performing this standard matrix multiplication in three dimensions. This, is, this should be standard to anybody who has done any computer graphics, for example, a standard rotor translation matrix. And Another thing, another fact that's very important to state is that uh, if you have uh, an action over omega, then you automatically obtain an action of it over the signals x, which take omega to some feature space. Specifically, if I want to apply a group G, uh, sorry, group element G to a feature function x, that is the same as looking up x in the inverse transformed point that I care about. Why is this exactly what that is? Well, the inverse transform point tells me the point that will end up in that space after I apply G, right? Because G, G minus one cancels out. And here is an example of this on the surface of the sphere. So imagine I want to map, I want to rotate the entire sphere by a certain angle. I'm searching for the point that will end up in that place once the rotation is completed. And that is exactly the inverse rotated uh, transformation of that particular point. So this is a very useful formula generally when working with these kinds of systems. And another thing is that we will almost always assume the group action to be a linear operation. That is, uh, for example, here in the case of translations, if I have uh, a sum of two different images and I want to translate them, it shouldn't matter if I translate first and then sum the images or sum the images and then translate the result. I should get exactly the same result. And that is what the linearity implies. Okay, so now when we have all these properties, we can define the crucial part of the building blocks, which are group representations. So specifically, a representation of the group is just something that tells me for every symmetry, what is a matrix that I can multiply with to have the equivalent effect on my data. So this row of G takes a particular symmetry and gives you a matrix to multiply with to apply that effect. We just saw an example of this in the case of the Euclidean space where we rotated and translated. And here is another example. If you have a signal that lives on a 1D grid of five elements and you want to do a cyclic rotation, so a cyclic shift, it is the same as multiplying it with this shift matrix that you have at the bottom. You raise it to the power of n if you want to shift by n steps. And the only effect you have when you multiply that matrix with your features is that those features cyclically rotate. Nothing else happens. So that's exactly what the real representation is of that particular group. And once you have that, you can now define the critical properties of, uh, uh, of neural, that neural networks or any functions should have in order to satisfy the geometry induced by those symmetries. The first one is invariance. So we say that some function, some neural network F, maps your signals X on the input domain to some outputs Y. And we say that it's G invariant. If no matter what group I choose, uh, group operation I choose, applying the real representation row of G of that group element to X doesn't change the result. So output is unaffected by applying the symmetry on the input. In the case of image classification, this is translation invariance saying that your output class uh, of a CNN will not depend on any shifts inside the image. However, this works great if you want to have predictions on the whole input domain. But if you want to have predictions on individual nodes inside the domain, so for example, in the case of images, if you want to do segmentation, which is a prediction for every single pixel rather than the whole image, invariance is actually not what you want because it might destroy all the details about your input. And in fact, you might want the, the output to be different if you transform the input, but you want it to be different in a predictable way. So we have this more fine-grained notion of equivariance. So we say that a function f or a neural network f, which maps signals on the domain to updated signals on that domain, is equivariant to g if no matter what group action I choose, it doesn't matter if I apply it before or after applying my function. So it affects the input and the output in the same way. So what is the mathematical property here at play for, say, images and translation equivariance? If I have a segmentation problem, with a CNN and I shift my image to some extent, my segmentation mask must shift by the same amount. And that's it. Like this is a property encoded by CNNs and it embodies translation uh, equivariance. Those two properties are the main properties that we will use to build these uh, machine learning models. 
there is another important constraint because there are many functions that are both invariant and equivariant yet might be really unstable still when you use them. And that is because not everything that nature does is a symmetry transformation, at least not a symmetry transformation from a group that we're uh, preparing for. So imagine I have this picture of a house in the upper left. Now my convolution neural network will be resistant to pure shifts. So if I shift the image, as you see in the upper right, then the convolution network is perfectly prepared for that and it will give me exactly the same answer. This is mathematically guaranteed. However, in the real world, the nature will not just shift the image, but it might also apply some weird noise and distortions and stuff like that to the image, as you can see in the lower right. And that's often how real data looks like. And uh, as a result, the network is not completely prepared for these kinds of transformations. And as a result, some tiny discrepancies in the input if we're not careful, might be might make the signal very unstable. And uh, well, I cannot go through all of the math for the purposes of this talk, but what we derive in our proto book is that the way to fight this is to keep your layers local. So have every pixel only look at some neighborhood of the pixels, not the whole image at every step. And as a result, if you have an error somewhere, that error will stay locally contained and not immediately propagate everywhere, destroying the stability of your signal. And this is the reason why when we build convolutional neural networks, it's typically good to have smaller convolutional filters like three by three or something, but then make the network very deep to propagate information across the image. So using all of that, we define the key building blocks of geometric deep learning that we will use to specify basically all the architectures uh, that we care about. And I'll go through these in some interesting order. The first one is the two types of layer that we just described, so equivariant and invariant layers. Uh, we make the equivariant layers also be linear. I'll explain in a moment why that is enough. So linear equivariant layers, they take some signal on a domain to a different signal on the domain such that the equivariance condition is satisfied. And also invariant layers, or as we call them global pooling, in case you need an output on the, on the whole input rather than just the individual input elements. And why is it enough to have linear equivariant layers? First of all, that's very important for us because for many interesting symmetry groups, you can exactly mathematically solve for what are all the linear equivariants with respect to this group. So you can be very accurate about it. For example, in the case of uh, images and translations, you can prove that exactly the only layer that is linear and equivariant to that group is the convolution. So you can never invent anything else other than the convolution which works uh, geometrically for this. So why is it still okay to just focus on linear layers? Well, that's because in deep learning, we do nonlinearity slightly differently. We actually have an activation function which we apply separately to every component of our feature space. And you can usually prove that uh, Composing a linear layer with this uh, pointwise nonlinearity gives you all of the usual universal approximation properties that you might want. So it's okay to focus only on linear equivariance because this composition will be enough to give us uh, universal fitting power. And lastly, I won't talk about it too much, but sometimes, especially when you have these pooling operations or you want to do hierarchical multi scale reasoning it is usually a good idea to try to course in the domain. So to take a signal from an input domain omega to a maybe slightly smaller domain omega prime, which captures the coarsening structure inside your inputs. And taking all of these together, you arrive at a generic architectural structure, which looks something like this. You have your input signal here. I give a generic graph structured domain because it's like a, the standard way to describe irregular discrete data. You run a bunch of equivariant layers with some nonlinearities in the middle. If you need to, at some point, you do a pooling layer to reduce the size of the graph and make it, uh, make it more uh, compositional, then more equivariant layers. And then at the end, if you need a prediction over the whole graph, you add this invariant layer to the tail. And what we said is that this is generic enough to explain basically all of popular deep learning in use today. And in our book, we actually show very clearly how you can recover basically all of the fan favorites by just choosing a special case of a domain and a special case of a symmetry group. So we have very much used the ideas of Felix Klein to unify pretty much all of deep learning in use today. So as you can see, our architecture can explain CNNs, GNNs, deep sets, transformers, uh, and LSTMs, 
but also, interestingly, allows us to then also talk about architectures over more exotic domains like spherical CNNs over spheres, mesh CNNs over manifolds, and most recently, equivariant GNNs over uh, molecular graphs. So there's a bunch of different architectures of interest that we can talk about in terms of their um, in terms of their structure and their symmetries and how they arise. I will probably use uh, the remaining time I have to tell you about uh, deep sets, transformers, and GNNs, which are maybe the easiest direct application of our blueprint. But let's see how far we get. So yes, we will start by learning on sets. They might be seen as a slightly uh, weird first choice, but uh, they are an excellent stepping stone to a lot of other things. Uh, and they will allow us to drive things like transformers and GNNs very easily. So, and also their geometries are fairly simple. So we assume basically just the unordered collection of nodes. So we assume a graph with no edges. We only have V, which is the set of nodes and no edges. That's our domain omega. Then uh, we let, uh, because we want to featureize this domain, we let Xi be the feature vector of a particular node. And uh, now there's the question of how do we send these features to a machine learning model? A typical way in which that is done is by doing this feature stacking. So you create a new matrix capital X by stacking these rows together. So it has the shape number of nodes times number of features. And the ith row will give you the features of the ith node. And you need to note that the very act of you doing so is slightly weird and not necessarily good because we started by assuming that the set is unordered, just an unordered, unconnected collection of nodes. And the act of you stacking features in a matrix has specified an ordering of the nodes. You have node one, node two, and so on. And you know what would we like? We would like any function, any neural network applied over this data to not depend on this ordering that you've decided. So what do we want to do is something like this. So imagine I have a function that's applied on a set of these nodes, and then I perturb that set of nodes somehow by permuting it, I should get exactly the same outcome in the case of permutation invariance. So we have a direct instantiation of our blueprint for the symmetry group of n element permutations or sigma n, and uh, our group elements in this case are just permutations. So to talk about this, it will be very useful to think about operators that change the node order, and those operations, as you know, as I've just mentioned, are called permutations. For a set of n elements, there is n factorial many of them. And here is one example of a permutation of five elements. Clearly, a permutation is a symmetry of this set because applying a permutation on a set doesn't change the elements inside the set. So as long as you assume it's unordered, this is an OK symmetry to have. And the convenient part is that when we talk about being resistant to permutations, we never have to leave the realms of linear algebra because every permutation defines a unique n by n matrix, which uh, is also known as a permutation matrix. And the only effect it has when you left multiply it with this node feature matrix is to permute the nodes and leave everything else completely unchanged. So that's exactly the collection of operations you wanna be resistant to. And if you remember all that definitions I've done around group actions, the permutation matrix is the group action for the permutation group. So every specific permutation defines a unique n by n matrix, and that's exactly the group action of that symmetry. And once you have that, uh, you can use this to derive uh, many classes of standard uh, architectures that respect permutation and variance and equivariance over these models. So as we followed before, any function applied to px must give exactly the same output if it's permutation invariant. And in the case of equivariance, uh, it must uh, give uh, the same output but permuted. And one standard way, and we can prove it's actually the only way to get uh, this kind of uh, locality and equivariance in sets, is to apply a shared function psi to every single element of the set separately. And then if we need an invariant prediction, as our blueprint uh, recommends, you do a global pooling with this uh, permutation invariant aggregator O plus, which can be anything like summing, maximizing, averaging, or something like this. And then you can apply another neural network phi to the summed vectors in order to compute the output for the whole set. And here you can see, this is by the way, the popular deep sets model that was published at NeurIPS uh, 2017 by Manzel, Zahir, and others. You can clearly see an equivariant part in blue and an invariant part at the end in red. 
So exactly following our blueprint, you can derive the deep sets model. And it is actually uh, possible to prove that over many classes of input sets, you can never build a more accurate uh, architecture, like any permutation equivariant or invariant architecture over sets without assuming any additional structure in that set must follow this particular form, must be re-expressible as a function like f of x in here. And there are clear applicabilities that show that these kinds of architectures are not just part of theory, but are also applicable in real world tasks. So the point net model, which is a very popular point cloud method in computer vision, basically has exactly the same geometric architecture as deep sets. It just uses the max pooling rather than the sum pooling, but it's already quite powerful. It processes these points in isolation, pulls them and predicts the outputs. And it's very accurately able to predict uh, which object it is based on a point cloud, even if that object is only partially visible. And you can imagine how predicting things from point clouds can be very uh, meaningful uh, subtasks in, say, a self-driving car system. Okay, so now that we have covered the essence of learning on sets, I can make the jump and talk about learning on graphs. Uh, specifically, uh, we used to have only a set of nodes. Now we have also a set of edges, E. And the E is just a collection of pairs of nodes that are connected. And there are many ways to represent these edges, but since we work uh, on uh, uh, in the domain of linear algebra, I will use a linear algebra way to represent the edges too. So that would be an adjacency matrix A, uh, which is a binary matrix of shape nodes times nodes, uh, such that uh, element IJ is equal to one if those two nodes are connected and otherwise zero. So this now makes edges part of the domain, omega. And there are many other things you can do to these edges, like you can put uh, edge features and stuff like that on them. That's all possible, but just for the sake of simplicity, I ignore it in this particular case. The math is exactly the same, it just looks more cumbersome. And in fact, the things we wanted over sets, the things we want over graph inputs are still the same. We still want permutation invariance and equivariance, at least without assuming any additional kinds of symmetries. So what's really changed if you think about it? So here is the rule that we wanted to respect for sets. If I change the order of nodes in a set, I should still get exactly the same answer. Well, in reality, nothing's really changed, strictly speaking, when we move to graphs. The only difference is that now these nodes have some edges connecting them. So if I ever decide to permute or perturb these nodes, I need to perturb the edges in exactly the same way. But otherwise, the rule is still the same. So that's why I said, uh, like when I said that uh, studying learning on sets first will allow us to more easily transition into learning on graphs, this is what I was referring to. And this then immediately gives you the rules for permutation, invariance, and equivariance over graph structured inputs. So whenever you permute the node features X, you now need to equivalently permute the adjacency matrix. And because the adjacency matrix is of shape nodes times nodes, you need to permute both the rows and the columns of the adjacency matrix. And in terms of linear algebra, this amounts to PAP transposed for a permutation matrix P. And now you get uh, your updated rules for invariance and equivariance. They look pretty much exactly as you would expect. It's just that now the edges are an important part of the input. So we make them a part of the input of the graph neural network. But other than that, uh, the rules are exactly the same. So with invariance, if I permute my nodes in the graph and edges, then I get the same answer. In equivariance, if I permute my nodes and edges, I'll get the same answer, but permuted. So uh, this is what I'm, I'm assuming, by the way, that this layer returns node features and doesn't update the adjacency matrix, which is often uh, the common assumption to make. So as a result, I can just say PF rather than uh, splitting it out into nodes and edges. Uh, but what's different? So this part basically directly carries over from sets. But one thing is quite different in that, as I said, in sets to do locality, which was the third important constraint, we had to basically transform every set element separately and not do any recombination whatsoever. So now we have a graph structure, so we know what are the neighbors of a particular node. So we can talk more concretely about what a local layer is. So we have a node's neighborhood, Ni, which often is defined by just the set of all the nodes linked to it with an edge. And this then means we can also extract all the neighborhood features. So a set, uh, a multi-set to be specific, Xni, which contains all the features of your adjacent nodes. And now our local function phi doesn't just have to look at one node. 
it can also look at all of the neighborhood node features. So this is how we update what we had with sets to work on graphs. And once you have a layer like this, you can apply it to every node neighborhood in isolation and stack the results in a new matrix. And that's your permutation equivariant layer. Well, there is one tiny caveat in that uh, this phi function now operates over a multi set of neighbors. So it must be resistant to the order in which you present those neighbors. So as long as phi is permutation invariant, we can conclude that F will be permutation equivariant. It's a fun exercise if you have some time afterwards to play around with some algebra on this, uh, on this input uh, to prove that this is actually the case. But I hope intuitively it makes sense. And now I must stress, I've told you a lot of math uh, that kind of culminated in this particular formula, but it now is a good moment to kind of take a pause, step back and see visually what is all of this that I just derived. So I said basically that one way to define a valid permutation equivariant neural network over graphs or graph neural network as we call it, is basically to define a local function that looks at one node, looks at all the nodes in its immediate vicinity and updates its representation. So it goes from the X features to a latent space H. Uh, and now you can apply that to every single node separately in its neighborhoods to update their representations. And once you have that kind of layer, how can you use it to more generally learn stuff over graphs that is interesting? Uh, you start with these inputs where you have features in the nodes, uh, XI, and you also have some adjacency matrix. Your graph neural network, once it's applied, as we discussed, will uh, typically update those features to some latent space. Um, but typically, uh, we won't have time to discuss this further, but these layers typically will not update the adjacency matrix. And once you have these updated node features, what can you do with them? Well, you can classify individual nodes. So send these HIs to a classifier. This now gives you an architecture that's fully equivariant start to finish. You might also be interested in classifying entire graphs, which is now an invariant rule. So before you can send the features to a classifier, you must somehow compress them in an invariant way. And as we discussed, one typical way to do that is to combine them with a permutation invariant aggregator, which is this O plus here. So it can be summing, averaging, maximizing, whatever. And finally, graphs have this additional modality of the domain, which, is link, uh, which are links or edges. You can either predict properties of edges or even predict whether edges exist at all, which is known as the link prediction problem. Once again, you can feed equivariantly the features of the two nodes uh, incident to that edge or any edge features we might have on that edge to predict existence or properties of links. And I note that I haven't actually told you yet how to implement this particular neural network layer, uh, because I said, if you have a local layer, then you can uh, define the global layer by just applying it in isolation to every neighborhood. So here are three most popular, if not all popular flavors of building these local graph neural network layers. So as you can see, it has a node, it has all the nodes in its immediate neighborhood and how it updates the representation of that node based on the others. From left to right, you have convolutional, attentional and message passing layers, which uh, progressively increase in expressive power but uh, decrease in scalability, interpretability, and uh, also uh, ease of learning them. So uh, they're more prone to overfit. Uh, convolutional layers specify up front some constant and uh, then use that, to, um, use that to update all of the node features through a fixed weighted combination. Often these coefficients are very simple based on the adjacency structure, like an average or something like that. Uh, then, so obviously this doesn't really help you tell your neighbors apart if uh, the graph structure doesn't say anything. So that's why we sometimes have to move on to an attentional mechanism, which uh, infers uh, these coefficients dynamically using uh, a neural network A. So here you take the sender and the receiver node and they collaborate to compute a particular scalar. And then that scalar is used to weigh the different neighbors. This now allows you to dynamically choose based on the features that you don't want to take into account some of your neighbors when you're aggregating them. And finally, the full on message passing, when you believe that weighted combinations are no longer what you need, you actually want a more general edge recipe message passing. So you take the features of your sender and receiver and compute an entire vector. This is the psi of x i x j. That entire vector, the message vector m, is sent across that particular edge. And then the receiver node aggregates those messages together. 
uh, it should be clear how uh, going from uh, right to left, uh, the subsequent layers are special cases of the preceding layers. So attention is a special case of message passing, convolution is a special case of attention with a fixed attention mask. And one note that we can make here in terms of uh, the most, one of the most popular architectures in using deep learning nowadays, the transformer, is when you look at the equation of a transformer, which I copied in the top right, it is exactly the same equation as what I just showed you for uh, the attentional mechanisms. It's just that uh, it operates over a complete graph. So all of the neighbors, um, all of the neighbors are considered when you do these kinds of aggregations. And uh, specifically, so you have a fully connected attentional flavor graph neural network and you get a transformer. Now, of course, transformers weren't originally applied for graphs, they were applied for sequences. So you might be wondering where does the sequential stuff come into play? Well, actually there's nothing in the transformer architecture that is sequential data specific. They have these positional embeddings that they inject as additional features. And uh, basically that is what hints to the model that maybe it should consider that this used to be a sequence, but the model is in no way forced to do that. And in fact, very often, this flexibility allows the model to pick apart random connections between the words that have nothing to do with their proximity in the sentence. And this is what gives the transformer its power over recurrent neural networks. And you can imagine these attention coefficients as basically taking that fully connected graph of words and inferring which pairs of words are more influentially tied to each other. So basically inferring its own soft graph structure, letting the graph neural network choose its own edges. If you, this is obviously a very deep and intricate connection that uh, I don't have enough time to talk to you about in this uh, space, but if you'd like to find out more, I would uh, highly recommend you take a look at Chaitanya Joshi's uh, article for the gradient, which is titled Transformers or Graph Neural Networks. Okay, so for the last point, before we uh, round off this discussion, uh, I'd like to talk to you about one specific type of graph, which is the geometric graph. So in many cases, so we looked at graphs as a discrete unordered set of nodes and edges, but very often that's not the whole story and there could be additional symmetries in the graph structured inputs that you have. Uh, so the graph might often have some spatial geometry and it might be useful for us to also exploit that. Molecules are a very classical case where different atoms have different three-dimensional spatial positions. And this goes all the way from small molecules to the space of proteins where also geometric architectures like AlphaFold have recently been quite successful. So how does this work? We'll make a simple assumption that nodes uh, now have features and also three-dimensional coordinates. And uh, if I have uh, an equivariant message passing layer, you look at these two separately. So you update the features and you update the coordinates separately. And now we can talk about not just the permutation symmetry group, but another symmetry group you might want to be resistant to. And in the case of molecules, we might want to be resistant to rotations and translations and reflections of those molecules, because technically it's still the same molecule if I choose to rotate, translate, or flip it. And that gives us the Euclidean group uh, um, E of three. And what are the actions in this Euclidean group for any three-dimensional orthogonal matrix in a translation vector? You can, up, uh, you can apply the transformation to these coordinates by applying the rotation matrix to them and then shifting them. And typically applying them to those coordinates should not affect the features inside the molecule. And there exist many elegant solutions that obey this equivariance property. And uh, some of them, you can even use mathematical tools like spherical harmonics to like explicitly compute the set of all equivariant functions and use that. But there are other like, so basically there's two approaches in geometric deep learning. You can either propose one function that's elegant and prove that it works, that it has equivariance, or you can mathematically rigorously compute the entire set of all equivariant functions and then use that as your basis. Uh, this is an example of the first stra strategy from Victor Garcia that was published at ICML last year, and it's the EN equivariant GNN, which uh, basically, if you look at the equation, it looks a lot like the standard message passing that I showed you before. The only difference is that now I include the coordinates only in this way, like I add the distance between the coordinates as a feature to the message function, and I don't include the coordinates anywhere else. Why is this important? It's because the Euclidean group action is an isometry. When I rotate, translate, or flip my molecule, the distances between the points stay the same. So this guarantees that my scalar features will be updated in exactly the same way. 
And then I can do something similar when updating coordinates, make sure it's kind of a weighted average of existing coordinates in a way that will not depend on any of those transformations. So basically, if I were to transform my input coordinates by rotating and translating, I'll get that my updated features will not change and my updated coordinates will rotate and translate the same way as expected. So this satisfies equivariance. Now, there is one thing to keep in mind, which is some of these features might themselves depend on the geometry. For example, they could be forces between the atoms, and those are vectors that now when I rotate, those vectors need to rotate as well. And the previously discussed model that I showed you would not take this into account. Now, Victor Garcia in that same paper and others propose a variant that actually works with vectors. So now you split out a new type of feature for your vectors and you need to make a new function that updates those vectors in an equivariant way. But as you can see, you know, this issue keeps reappearing as you tensor up your features going beyond vectors to larger uh, dimensionalities. And you can actually talk about a general set of solutions using the irreducible representations of this symmetry group. And that's what tensor field networks are all about. Uh, I will skip the details. There's a lot of details that arise from the math, but what it boils down to is basically a message passing between different orders of features, uh, such that uh, the exact interactions are governed by these matrices that are pre-computed from the spherical harmonics. So this is a representation you can pre-compute based on the three-dimensional Euclidean symmetry group. And also this idea has been extended to transformers by Fabian Fuchs and Daniel Worrell that was published at NeurIPS 2020 and basically allowed you to put all these things into the key query and value mechanisms of attention. So this is the overall pipeline. I will just skip this uh, in the interest of leaving enough time for questions. I'll just briefly mention that uh, this idea of doing stuff over a graph with geometries can extend now to arbitrary manifold domains, which is very relevant for computer graphics, protein design, fMRIs. And in fact, uh, I don't have enough time to go into details of this, but if you want to do message passing over these kinds of weird surfaces, what you'll end up with uh, using the concepts of parallel transport is more or less the same as if you did message passing over a geometric graph. So specifically, what's the difficulty here? When you had normal convolution in an image, you could move a filter from A to B in any way and you'll get exactly the same answer. However, if you have a manifold and you want to move a filter, say from the mouse to the right ear, there are many different paths in which you can choose to slide the filter. And the path you choose depends, uh, like determines what's the orientation of the filter you're going to get. So if I go from the mouse directly to the right ear, I'll get a filter on one orientation. If I instead choose to first go on the top of the head and then roll down to the ear, I'll get a completely rotated filter. So this is something that's path dependent and we must be very careful about what it means to slide a filter across a manifold. But that doesn't mean we weren't able to recover some very influential architectures from this blueprint already, including the geodesic CNN uh, and the gauge equivariant mesh CNN. But if you look at the equations of the gauge equivariant mesh CNN, you'll find this equation is basically like a graph neural network. You have a node of the mesh, U. You update its features by summing over all the neighboring nodes, V, on the mesh. The only difference is you have this extra row component, which is a parallel transport matrix, which transport the frame of reference from point U to point V. And uh, that's something you pre-compute based on the structure of the mesh. So really graph neural networks have come up once again, even over complicated mesh objects. There's just a little bit of math that needs to be done at the beginning to make sure your features transform accordingly to the mesh structure. So that was my last slide. Just wanna shortly summarize what we covered. Uh, we covered the geometric foundation of neural networks and graph neural networks specifically. We talked about invariance and equivariance, deep sets as an instance of permutation equivariant learning over sets, GNN is a special case of uh, permutation equivariant learning over graphs, transformers as a special case of a fully connected attentional GNN. Then we showed how you can compose two different symmetries to learn over graphs with coordinates. And finally, how to link all that to learning over manifolds and meshes. We're very actively trying to improve our proto book because we have this 2023 book release coming up. So if you want to make any influence to what will come out uh, and you have some time to read through this book or leave any feedback to what I just told you, any and all feedback is super welcome. You can find all details on geometricdeeplearning.com. And that was actually my last slide. Thank you very much for listening.